Welcome everyone to the Conflict Analytics Lab at Homecoming 2021. My name is Avinash Pele. I am a 3L project leader at the Conflict Analytics Lab, where I also work as student director. We are delighted today to be able to demonstrate some of the legal aid and um, public benefit tools that Conflict Analytics Lab has been developing over the past year. Every year we come out to Homecoming to try and show Queen's Law alumni the variable work that we do at the lab, as well as the way that students get involved on a day-to-day -day basis towards making these AI legal projects a reality. So we will begin with a quick note from myself and from George Ray, who is a partner at Bora Ladner Gervais LLP. George Ray will be speaking briefly about the uh, BLG co collaboration project, after which um, Professor Samuel DeHaan will join us, um, albeit virtually, with a short video that demonstrates you know, an overview of what the lab is, as well as giving our attendees a brief understanding of how we work as an organization. Professor DeHaan was unfortunately unable to join us today and has recorded a pre-recorded video that will demonstrate what I've mentioned before. After Professor DeHaan has had the opportunity to demonstrate his video, uh, we will then move on to a presentation by Holly Grosdanis and Solene Jung. Um, Holly and Solene are project leaders uh, in 2L with the Conf Analytics Lab, and they will be discussing some of our employment and harassment related projects in the AI sphere. After Holly and Solene have spoken, um, I will be joining you again on screen to discuss consumer investment and consumer complaints, which is a project that I've had the opportunity to work on since my 1L year with the Confit Analytics Lab. After I've spoken about consumer complaints, Anna Zhu, a 3L project leader with the lab, will be joining us for a presentation on our trademarks AI, which um, is one of the few AIs that we are building in the deep mind and in the image recognition sphere. Um, after Anna has presented, um, the BLG presentation will be delivered by Caroline Ross, a 3L innovation intern with BLG and the Conflict Analytics Lab, as well as George Ray, who's joining me on screen right now. Um, after the BLG presentation is concluded, I will join you once again on screen to discuss the Vaccine Mediator, which is another project that I've had the opportunity to lead. We will then close off with a few remarks from Professor Stephen Thomas of the Smith School of Business, Zhao Don Zhu, from computer science, and Rohan Bomboria, who is a PhD student in AI that works with the lab. Finally, at the end, I will be joining you along with the remainder of our project leaders on screen to answer any questions um, or comments that you may have regarding the presentation delivered prior. And finally, just a quick note that this presentation will be recorded and it will be transcribed for viewers um, in the future. And with that, um, I'm going to show you a quick overview video delivered by Samuel DeHaan to demonstrate um, the labs functions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Samuel Dehan, Director of the Conflict Analytics Lab and Law Professor at Queen's University. The CAL is a research consortium interested in analytics, analytics research for dispute resolution. It was created at Queen's Law in 2018. We have gathered experts drawn from across industry and academia, including McGill, Queens, Columbia Business School, as well as Scotiabank Bank and BLG. The Conflict Analytics Lab has two missions. First, analytics research for access to justice, notably with the creation of legal help tools for the public. Second, AI research with and for dispute resolution professionals, lawyers, but also other industry partners that are dealing with high volume of disputes on a regular basis. Over the first few years, we have mostly concentrated on our access to justice mandate. We have developed several AI models and deployed these models via an online legal aid platform, MyOpenCourt. MyOpenCourt is a legal aid system designed to help self-represented litigants to predict the odds of winning a case. For instance, our latest tool, the Vacuum Mediator, uses predictive analytics to assess whether reported symptoms are medically recognized side effects that could result in eligibility for compensation in either Canada or the US. In addition, eligible users will be matched with a trained mediation case worker who will assist them in submitting a claim to the rele relevant composition scheme. My colleague, our student director, Avinash Pile, will tell you a little bit more about this 
project and my open court in general. Lately, we have become more interested in collaborating with industry partners to develop intelligent dispute settlement systems. In particular, we are trying to advance the application of AI research to conflict resolution in a broad sense, namely by training models on both legal data such as case law, but also on negotiation and mediation agreements. We know that dispute settlement is fundamentally about bargaining in the shadow of the law, where lawyers resolve disputes by speculating on what would happen if a court were to decide the matter. However, I think, and we think, that making predictions based solely on past legal precedents can produce inaccurate predictions, mostly because the models are trained on incomplete data sets. In fact, in many areas, such as consumer, municipal, employment disputes, approximately 90% of cases end up being resolved through negotiation. So when it comes to selecting data sets for training artificial intelligence algorithms, legal data constitute only the tip of the iceberg. So thanks to a partnership grant that we've recently obtained, we've been able to develop analytics research for dispute resolution. For instance, we are currently working with BLG on developing a predictive negotiation systems for municipal disputes and personal injury disputes more broadly. So this system is trained on both legal and mediation negotiation agreements held by BLG. George Ray, partner at BLG will tell you a little bit more about this project. So now we're looking to expand into other areas, uh, including consumer finance and insurance. For instance, we're looking at to work with wealth management firms to find new ways to resolve investment disputes by assessing whether suitability standards have been made by an investment advisor. Again, this will be discussed in more detail by my colleagues and I'd like to thank you very much for your time and I look forward to our discussion. Wonderful. So after hearing from Samuel Dahan, I'm going to pass the mic briefly to George Ray, who is a partner at Bordner Ladner Gervais LLP for a short introduction. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Abby, and thanks, Samuel, as well, too. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, not only as an alumnus of Queens, um, but to talk briefly about the Conflict Analytics Lab and the collaboration that it has, certainly with my firm, Board and Lander Gervais, but from the other uh, collaborations you're going to hear about today. And I think it's the, the point of those collaborations is where we get new insight, new information to age-old questions that we haven't been able to solve adequately. I think we can begin to ask new questions, get new insight, but then also begin to answer some of those problems that we've been facing with. And, you know, bringing in disparate views, different views is, is key. And I think the Faculty of Law at Queens and the Smith School of Business and the Conflict Analytics Lab is doing exactly what we need to do, bringing in that collaboration to help us address systemic issues that we haven't been able to resolve. So you hear more about the Queen's uh, project we have with BLG later, and I, I would encourage everyone to really think about the collaborative efforts um, in your own industries, in your own practices, in your own businesses, because I think this is just a fantastic opportunity to get new insights. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, George, for the warm introduction. I'm going to pass the screen over to Holly Grostanis, who will be able to demonstrate some of what George had mentioned previously. Um, Holly is a project leader with the Confident Analytics Lab, and she will be presenting about my open court and some of our employment law projects. Thanks. Thanks, Abby, and thank you all for coming. I am Holly, I'm a 2L project leader with the lab. This year I'm leading the employment project and I'm excited to tell you about our project as well as My Open Court more broadly. So what is My Open Court? Among other tools, My Open Court hosts a series of four practical and open source legal tools that can answer your legal questions in under five minutes. 
So the tools that you see here on the screen were all proposed and developed by students at one time or another. Each of these tools can be used by both employers and by workers. So we have our termination compensation calculator, which can calculate how much compensation in dollar amounts a user could be entitled to. We have our wage cut tool, which helps the user determine whether their wage cut constitutes a constructive dismissal. We have our layoff tool, which helps users to determine if their layoff is illegal and if they should be receiving compensation. And finally, we have our worker classification tool, which calculates um, whether a user is an employee or a contractor under the Employment Standards Act, and thus if they are entitled to things like overtime, vacation pay, and benefits, and things like that. So now I'll give you a little bit of insight into the process using our employee contractor tool as the example. So the user will start by um, taking a short survey on the characteristics of their employment. So they'll be asked questions like, what industry do they work in? Whether their job is supervised? Who delegates their work tasks to them? And whether they're, they work exclusively for their hirer. And then using past case law that rely on the Sagaz case, the model will predict the user's status as either an employee or a contractor based on those survey answers. At the end of the survey, the tool will connect the user with further legal information, outputting a list of relevant case law and statute, um, and also provide the user with the option to contact a dispute resolution professional um, for a free consultation. The goal of this tool is really to provide people outside of the legal profession, maybe self-represented litigants, with employment law information in a straightforward and digestible fashion. So My Open Court is really the Conflict Analytics Lab um, flagship project and has been here since the lab's inception. This project typically engages the most students um, and volunteer researchers and has been a really great entry point for students into the lab in 1L, including myself last year. Prior to starting at the lab, I considered data science and machine learning really out of my wheelhouse, but since beginning with the lab last year, I've learned so much about the field and where legal technology and innovation is going. So finally, I wanted to conclude by sharing some of our project goals for this year. Um, we've seen quite the increase in users throughout the pandemic for our termination compensation calculator and our layoff tool. Um, but at the same time, we noticed that our worker classification tool wasn't, seeming, wasn't seeing the same uptick in users. So we've been conducting some market research to understand what people are searching for on Google when they look, um, look up employment law related issues, as well as trying to make the tool more accessible to people outside of the legal profession. And um, on top of that, we're also looking to increase our accuracy. We've been, we've had really great success in training our models to um, predict more than 85% of the, the time, but we're always striving to increase our accuracy. And we can do this by making sure we keep our data set uh, updated with the most relevant case law and auditing our data set to ensure accuracy. So that's a little bit about our project and thank you all for listening. I encourage you to check out um, my open cord and take one of the tools for a spin. If you're interested, I will now hand the floor over to Celine uh, to speak about our harassment tool. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Celine. I'm a 2L project lead for the harassment investigation tool that is currently being developed. So Cal has been working on using an AI powered system to determine uh, whether workplace investigations comply with principles of procedural fairness. So we're not looking at whether the event had occurred or not, but just objectively determining whether the investigation process itself was fair. And drawing from case law, Cal has identified criteria to assess whether an investigation has been conducted properly. So for some context, oh, let me see. There we go. So for some context, the duty for an employer to investigate is well established in case law, but also codified, for instance, in Ontario. So when there is a workplace harassment, um, complaint or incident, according to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, an employer shall ensure that investigation is conducted that is appropriate in the circumstances. Um, this is important to both employers and employees since one, a proper investigation will help determine what actually happened, help the employer decide what will happen to the employee, and also 
um, bring light to maybe any other issues going on in the workplace. And second, the failure to conduct a fair and neutral investigation process could lead to damages, another investigation being ordered, or setting aside the employer's sanctions. However, the case law and the language of the legislation itself is quite broad, and we wanted to make that process easier for parties to navigate. And so the tool also addresses a handful of other questions that are important to consider during the investigation process, like who should be conducting the investigation in the first place, uh, was the determination made by the investigator uh, free of any bias, and what are the responsibilities of the investigator before, during, and after the investigation. And so I'll also mention that the team has been working on finalizing the questionnaire for federal employees or federal workers, as well as looking into ways that we can tailor the questionnaire for each province and other provinces. Um, and so the Conflict Analytics Lab has designed a questionnaire that an employee can answer post-investigation that will show whether their investigation had potential flaws. And this is just an example of what that would look like if the user had selected yes for this question, for example, then after completing the questionnaire, based on the user's answers, the output would flag those potentially problematic issues to the user, as well as provide relevant legal information. They can also download their own report for their records and be connected to a legal professional as well, like our other tools. Um, so there are a handful of ways the tool could be applied. Um, now this version of the questionnaire would be useful for employees who have already experienced an investigation and are wondering if they were treated fairly. So it could be used as a general tool made available to the public, um, for example, on our website to facilitate legal aid. Um, at the same time, through our future industry partnerships, we could work to create a more tailored version of the tool that would only be accessible to that organization and would be based on the availability of internal data. Um, this would also include other features depending on the organization's needs, such as a reporting component that would aid in the centralization of all workplace complaints and can be applied to the pre-investigation stage where a tailored checklist can be utilized by internal investigators to mitigate potential flaws from occurring in the first place. And so overall, in doing all this, we offer better understanding and transparency of the investigation process, a greater look into potential issues in the investigation that the tool highlights, and a valuable output for the user of a report that can be easily communicated, and also with partnerships, a way to deter potential legal issues for employers. Um, and so that is a quick little snippet of the harassment investigation tool. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll be kicking it back off to Abby. Great, thank you so much, Solene. I'm going to share my screen and begin my first presentation on a project, which will be for a moment, which will be for consumer complaints. All right, so consumer complaints, a look into the creation of a predictive AI. The purpose of this presentation is a little bit different from our other My Open Core presentations or some of our presentations on products that we have already released in the sense that the Consumer Complaints Project really is an example of a failed project, or rather a project that's been placed on hiatus due to certain technological concerns that the labs face. And I think it really does answer some of the burning questions our audience might have, such as one, what is an actual legal AI? What does it mean to be a legal AI? Two, how is it possible that students are creating something that is seemingly so complex? And three, what does it actually mean to train a model? What are these legal AIs capable of? You know, what are the realms of possibilities that could be had given the availability and access to data? So moving forward, consumer complaints, it's, it really is a very broad area of the law. As many know, you know, consumer complaints can manifest at a McDonald's when you complain about customer service in the same way a consumer complaint can manifest when a credit card institution charges you a loan repayment that you're actually not owed. And so, you know, consumer complaints really is it can cover a variety of areas, including healthcare, financial trademarks and IP law and the variety. And so, you know, consumer complaints was a very difficult point, a starting point, I would say. You know, the project was given to me by Samuel Dehan with kind of an air of, you know, try it out and see what we can do. And that really is the approach that Professor Dehan takes to student learning at the Conflict Analytics app. I think that's really what makes us shine is that students are trusted for their expertise and for their ability to learn and adapt, you know, that no one is going to produce something perfect on the first try. And so, you know, I was tasked with trying to figure out how we could create a predictive AI in the consumer complaint sphere. 
And when I say predictive AI, I, I, I'm, I'm explaining something I think very quintessential, which, you know, a step back from litigating robots. Um, most people, when they think of legal AIs or think about predictive AIs that can, you know, synthesize case law, predict damages and predict outcomes. And so the question becomes, you know, where do you start? Where do you start with something like this? And so what I did first was I conducted a tremendous amount of research, which, you know, research really is grounded in everything that our legal researchers and our project analysts do. You know, fundamentally, we are law students. And I tried to explain, you know, like from a legal side that when our Queens law students are working on this, we try to leverage the expertise of, you know, other students like our Smith business students are tremendously educated and capable of doing many of the business aspects of our projects and so you know we try to really narrow in on the legal issues and so when we do legal research i tell people that a legal ai is fundamentally grounded in case law it is trying to understand and trying to annotate a large domain of cases and look for patterns and try to codify those patterns and then going through a process of trial and error until what you have codified is producing the right answer 999 times out of 1000. And so I started off by looking for data um, on consumer complaints, which to my surprise pretty much does not exist. Um, for those who know, consumer complaints is a very um, settlement heavy area of the law. The vast majority of consumer complaints do end in settlements and very few of them reach court, let alone higher courts where precedents are set. And so, you know, finding the data points needed to actually train a model like this is a natural concern. Um, you know, moving forward, what, what we actually ended up doing was we used an American data set that had over 1 million consumer complaints. And the purpose of this really was to, you know, just try our best to synthesize the data that's available and make judgments about what the market and what the issues faced are. And so we split things into issues and sub issues. And we realized very quickly that within consumer complaints, the only cases that are really reaching court are financial in nature. And so financial services and credit services are by far the most commonly um, litigated areas of consumer complaints. And, you know, this was it, at, at first, it seemed fruitless, but by doing this, we actually narrowed down which area of consumer cl complaints would be best focused on. And so now that we had an area of the law to look into, our project group was able to read 800, 900 cases in these areas to specifically find out what the common law is turning on. And you know, that really is where the magic is done, you know, that the common law can be in some ways codified and we can go into the head of a judge and give arbitrary value to certain things. You know that, for example, if you have evidence of a false misrepresentation, lawyers and law students know intuitively that this is probably important, but it's really hard for us to quantify that importance. And that's, that is what a fundamentally a legal AI does, is, is that we attempt to quantify the importance of certain common law aspects. We ask users questions that help answer those questions to be able to determine how the common law would view their case. And then we train the model to the point where it's consistently outputting good results. And so this is an example of, of, of a scenario that the consumer complaints AI actually would be able to help it. And so here we have a scenario of John, who is a former salesperson at, at the Bank of Montreal, who was disgruntled from his uh, dismissal and continued to kind of run a fraudulent scam afterwards with some elderly victims that he found. And so what we built was this. This is kind of your quintessential algorithm for a legal AI. And so, you know, here where it says, for example, question one, this is where the magic is, is that we have to, as a research group and as students, develop these questions. Think about the questions that matter and ask those questions to the user. So, for example, at question one, if they say no, obviously question one is an intro question, you take it right back to the start. But if they say yes, you're moved on to question two. Now, question two is another example of simple logic here, where based on yes or no on that question, we're able to give an arbitrary value of, let's say, plus or minus 50 points for something that we consider to be very highly weighted. You'll notice in other areas of this algorithm, there, be, there, there are instances of minus 20 or minus 10. Those are what we consider to be less important, but still relevant factors to a common law determination of a case. And so, you know, the users are essentially behind the scenes going through a giant algorithm like this, gathering and losing points in a variety of ways. And as they gather points, let's say they're given points for having evidence, that is flagged on a system and that is outputted to the user that this is the reason why you have a strong case. And then what we build at the end is this um, strength range that helps give the user an estimate of their case. And so as you can see, without any actual data, we're able to produce an algorithm like this, which is primarily and at its most basic level functional. Now the issue presented and the issue that we face and the reason why I say that this project was failed or is in hiatus is that there is no data for us to work with. Once we've created an algorithm like the consumer complaints AI, 
the only way for us to know if it works is to compare it to real life data. So for example, we can take a real life case, plug in the information into the algorithm and compare the output to how the case ended up in real life. And then if we continually do that over time with thousands of case points, eventually when we are training, quote unquote training, this is what we refer to as model training, the model will eventually output the right result 999 times out of a thousand. And so to do that, we need data. And of course, data is not readily available. And this is why we really accentuate how innovative the BLG project is, for instance, because law firms, government institutions, organizations sit on treasure troves of data that we as a lab are able to partner with and create bespoke ways of predicting the law. And so the consumer complaints AI is an example of, you know, given data by a firm or by a government organization, we would actually be able to produce a working AI with, you know, just an example of some of the bespoke or creative projects that we're open up so, or open to so far at the lab. And so I'll just segue into saying that, you know, the realm of possibilities are infinite. You know, consumer complaints was one of the hardest areas we could try to build an AI in. Nonetheless, we realized that it was possible. And so what we are looking for is corporate, legal, government, or organizational partners that have this data, that are sitting on data that we can partner up with and use to produce useful public or private partnerships for our customers. Next, we're going to be joined by Anna Zhu, who will demonstrate a presentation on our trademarks AI. Thank you so much. All right, hi everyone. I uh, hope, okay, sorry. Hi everyone, I'm Anna and I'm a project leader with the Trademarks Project. So I am a 3L, but I've been with this project ever since 1L. So I've been with this project for quite a while now, but I'm happy to be here, happy to continue working on this project. And we've done a lot so far, but we have a lot of projects upcoming as well, and I'd love to introduce them to you today. So our main mission for the Trademarks Project is to increase access to justice for small to medium enterprises by providing a tool that will help them access their trademark rights. So we targeted small to medium enterprises in particular because we found through our research that they just aren't accessing their trademark rights as much as they could or should be. And one of the, or some of the main reasons are cost and just basic lack of knowledge. So our main project with this uh, project is to develop a deep learning tool that will help determine the likelihood of confusion between a trademark that is being sought and then one that already exists. So by using this, tool, our consumer can identify possible conflicts early, and with that, they can seek further legal advice if needed, and using a tool, they can avoid costly litigation. So how does this tool work? So putting a brief example together, imagine you're trying to register a trademark on the left. So you're not sure whether or not there will be a conflict with a trademark that already exists in the market. So actually on the law side, we have read and annotated hundreds of EU IPO cases and identified the key factors which goes into the likelihood of confusion analysis. So we've extrapolated that data and we've given that to our data scientists and they really worked all the magic to create a algorithm which will help determine the likelihood of confusion between them. So a bit of work we've completed up until now. As I've mentioned before, we've read and annotated over 500 EU IPO cases for input into our algorithm. Last year, we also wrote and submitted a feasibility study on AI trademark dispute resolution, which is actually commissioned by the EU IPO. Recently, um, our project members have published a book chapter in a forthcoming book next year. And we have done most of the work on our prototype website where we wish to launch our tool. And this website actually received the MyTex Accelerate Grant from the Lab to Market program. So here are a few uh, brief snapshots of our prototype website. More information about it will be given in an upcoming pro uh, presentation, so I won't really be going in detail about it, but uh, this is how it looks right now. And as for upcoming tasks, we have a lot coming up. So first we want to expand into the Canadian market. So right now we're actually examining the current state of the Canadian trademarks uh, case law. So we want to extrapolate the data from that and use it with our existing algorithm and um, provide a tool for consumers in Canada as well. 
And furthermore, we want to provide academic research for uh, research for academic publications and just continue assisting Professor Dehan in his research and uh, writing projects. As well, we want to continue refining our website and tool. We want to receive additional feedback from more lawyers and consumers and just continue refining it and trying to make it the best it can be. And yeah, thank you for listening. That's my presentation. Oh, and next up is uh, Caroline and George with BLG. Sorry. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a great day and thank you for coming out to our event. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the Intelligent Settlement System, which is a project centered around the future of litigation. Um, so my name is Caroline and I am a 3L innovation intern. I've been with the lab since 1L as a volunteer researcher on basically how judges gaze into a crystal ball uh, to determine how personal injury disputes um, get awarded. Um, so since June, I've been working on this project with three other law students and the BLG team. I'm also here with George, um, a partner at BLG who has really been championing this project from the very beginning. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into it and explain uh, the project and why I think it matters. Um, so in today's legal system, a vast majority of cases are settled through negotiations. With that in mind, BLG is harnessing the power of technology to ensure effective lit litigation through this collaborative effort with McGill University and the lab. Uh, the system will quantify the intuition of lawyers to create consistent and efficient dispute uh, negotiations and settlements. Um, so the system is therefore an objective tool which analyzes variables in a case to assist lawyers in forming negotiation strategies to reach ultimate uh, outcomes for their clients. The system is what I believe is the first of its kind to really harness the mass amounts of data behind settlement negotiations, which are private disputes. Uh, dispute resolution in general, but personal injury disputes specifically, is often seen as this black box driven only by a lawyer's intuition. So the system will help lawyers move beyond this approach by combining practical knowledge with data analytics. The initiative allows for a space where industry and academia intersects to deliver effective client services, which I think is really the groundbreaking aspect of this project. So BLG leaders, including George and Andrew Tarrett, uh, played an instrumental role in this collaborative project. Um, so again, the interest in furthering the academic study of law to improve the reality of legal practice led to significant success. Throughout the course of the project, um, we as a team learned about significant variables in reaching settlements and how that can be manipulated by technology. So after preliminary analysis, the team found that some variables need to be broader, broader and others more specific. So the legal team using BLG's wealth of experience created variables that were simple enough for the AI technology to analyze, but specific enough uh, to reveal the damages plaintiffs may be entitled to. So overall, the system will provide data-driven strategies that will improve the consistency and predictability of settlements. Uh, so the success of this project will be measured by the level of efficiency and effectiveness in creating a better assessment of cases that is consistent with both the lawyer's intuition and the related data um, in, a, in a project. Um, so, the, so through the continuous assessment of these factors, uh, the system will ultimately enhance client relationships. Lawyers will be able to have a better understanding of a client's portfolio and will be able to help a client um, predict each of their exposures to a type of injury. Uh, in doing this, this will allow clients to accurately budget for current and anticipated needs. Um, so while the while this system is the first of its kind, I do not believe that it will be its last as technology and law becomes intertwined to provide clients and uh, with efficient and affordable outcomes. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was kind of the stages of the project. Um, and we kind of did this in two main stages. So the first was data collection. So myself, the other law students and two masters of AI students were together to parse through over 300 files over the summer. Um, and so in doing that, we created about 80 different features about things that were related to the outcome of the settlement. Um, and then we also focused on data cleanup. So again, as I mentioned, making sure that the variables were specific but categorical so that the AI could actually filter through them. 
And then the next part is to actually create the tool for lawyers um, to not only continue adding to the data set, um, but to be able to actually filter through um, and, and use the tool effectively. Um, and honestly, I'm very privileged to be part of this project because I feel I'm helping the application of law evolve. And I believe that this type of project can be applicable to many other practice areas. So thank you for listening. And uh, back to you, Avi, to talk about the, me the vaccine mediation tool. Great, thank you so much, Caroline and George. I'm going to share my second presentation, which as Caroline mentions for the vaccine mediator. Okay, so the vaccine mediator. The vaccine mediator is the Conflict Analytics Lab's first project in the public health sphere, which I think goes to show you how our lab's operations have grown to expand over the last few years, as well as how the law can kind of bleed and actually affect areas of society that you may not think the law can affect. And I think, you know, public health is, is a prime example of that. And so the Vaccine Meteor is a project that I've had the opportunity of leading since approximately January of this year. And we have created the Vaccine Meteor in, in collaboration with the British Institute of Comparative Law, McGill University, and the Oxford Vaccine Group based out of Oxford University. We will begin with a short video. Have you received your COVID-19 vaccine? Did you experience any side effects? If so, the Conflict Analytics Lab at Queen's University may be able to help. We have launched a new online vaccine mediator tool. This online questionnaire is designed to help improve the COVID-19 vaccination process and help you understand your rights if you are injured by a COVID-19 vaccine. By completing a few quick questions, you'll gain access to accurate information regarding common COVID-19 vaccine side effects. Using our tool, you can report vaccine side effects, assess your eligibility for vaccine compensation, and get help submitting your compensation claim. Your participation will also help researchers studying the side effects of the COVID-19 vaccines. Reliable information, better research, fair compensation. The Vaccine Mediator Tool, powered by the Conflict Analytics Lab and the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. To learn more or use our tool, visit myopencourt.org. Great. I'm going to move forward. There we go. So what you're seeing right now on your screen is myopencourt.org, which of course is our free public legal aid service that Holly has mentioned in the past, where many of our employment and harassment tools are, are housed. So the homepage of My Open Court, it demonstrates what we think is kind of, you know, the flagship idea of Cal, which is predicting the odds of winning your dispute using AI technology. What you will see going forward, however, is indication of our newest flagship tool, which is Vaccine Mediator. We are currently anticipating Vaccine Mediator to be released at some point, either later this week or next week, with our beta iteration. And so I'd like to give the audience a quick glimpse into what Vaccine Mediator looks like how it works and why exactly we need a tool like Vaccine Mediator. So Vaccine Mediator fundamentally is a universal questionnaire. And so users can log in for free at myopencourt.org by clicking Vaccine Mediator and work through a variety of questions related to their vaccination case. And so for example, here you see one of our first questions asked the user which of the three approved vaccines in Canada and the United States that they were, that they took. Moving forward, you'll see a variety of other questions. And I think this question here really demonstrates some of the ancillary value of the Vaccine Mediator project, because not only are we able to actually help users in, in submitting their COVID-19 vaccine compensation claim, but we're able to conduct proprietary research on misinformation and vaccine side effects. And this is extremely useful because as a group of law students and a mixed group of medical students, doctors, um, and our advisory board, we're actually able to bring together the expertise of both lawyers and doctors to analyze both the legal aspects, the cross-cutting and comparative legal aspects of COVID compensation, but also the medical aspects such as causation and how the connection between getting a vaccine and actually having a side effect is created from a legal perspective. And so, for example, this question we ask users so that we are able as a lab to do research into misinformation and how users actually receive their scientific or non-scientific information. 
moving forward, you'll see an example of our output. And so this is really where like the smart features and the AI part of vaccine meters come, comes into play. And so by answering our short survey, users are provided with several things. Firstly, they're provided with the results of their survey, which is a document that succinctly indicates their vaccine experience. And the purpose of this document is to actually assist users with filling out the claim submission forms, which can be surprisingly complex, especially to a lay person. And so this document we provide users actually provides them with simple answers that they can then parse into their physical forms. Furthermore, we're able to smart assess the user's eligibility for compensation. And this is where the legal research and this is where our law students really got involved is creating an algorithm and creating an AI that can determine whether or not the user is pre-assessed for eligibility, pre-assessed for express eligibility, or not eligible for a compensation scheme, depending on the information that they have entered. Finally, we provide users with two what we would call smart takeaways from this tool. The first is a personalized next steps flowchart, which kind of you know synthesizes everything into a very visually pleasing and easily understandable flowchart that shows the user based off of their inputs how exactly they can go about getting their money and getting their compensation claim approved and submitted. And lastly, as you can see on the right, we have the option to submit your claim with us. This is a feature we've been working on um, in the creation of a mediation clinic at Queen's Law, or rather a mediation group of students in our project group that are able to provide administrative assistance to users after they've already filled out the tool. And so after we've provided users with all the materials that we believe they need to provide to file a COVID compensation scheme, uh, a COVID compensation claim, we are then able to assist them even further in the event that they further don't understand their, their case or they have some questions related to the COVID-19 vaccine claim. I think this is an example of what a negative output will look like. It'll show the user that they do not meet the eligibility criteria for compensation and will also give them the reasons for being ineligible. A final note that I would just like to make is that the vaccine mediator really is a unique problem faced by the law and faced by medicine that we felt that the conflict analytics lab was uniquely placed to address. The reason for this is that COVID-19 vaccine compensation is really a not talked about issue, but an issue nonetheless. You know, vaccine side effects are extremely, extremely, extremely rare, but in the event that they happen, it is extremely important that Canadian society has legal systems in place to provide compensation and to provide damages to those who may in a rare situation be harmed. I think the harsh reality is that in Canada, as of as of this day, there is no way of making that happen. And the reason for that is that it produces a vaccine such as Pfizer and Moderna have been indemnified by governments in return for their vaccines. Consequently, you, we, we have this concept of what we call no fault compensation scheme. A no fault compensation scheme is damages paid out of a tax fund that the government keeps because there is no way of actually suing the producers of the vaccine. A no fault compensation scheme allows governments to provide compensation to, to members of the public without actually admitting fault or prescribing blame or guiltiness to either party. Um, you know, despite that, the federal program has only been released as of June 6th, and the federal program has many issues such as the inability to submit online, as well as there are no AIs and there are no forms of assistance available whatsoever for members of the Canadian public. And so because of this, we find that through our research and also through our anecdotal experience that members of the public that otherwise would get the vaccine are hesitant to do so because they're worried that in the worst case scenario, if something were to go wrong, that they're effectively cut off from any form of, of reparations or any form of compensation whatsoever. And so the vaccine mediator is meant to address that. It's not meant to address a tremendously sized market. It's meant to address a small but very important market that we think it's important to help provide accurate information to, because this really is, I think, the key to herd immunity is that, you know, we're not targeting people who are already vaccinated because they've already done their research and gotten their vaccine, nor are we targeting users that have no chance in any scenario of getting the vaccine. The vaccine mediator is meant to target the people in the middle, people who lack the necessary information to make that determination and are waiting because of that. And we really think that if we're able to uh, promote and also do research into accurate data for COVID vaccine compensation that we can help push the Canadian society into herd immunity by providing accurate information. And that is the vaccine mediator. I am then going to pass the screen over to Professor Stephen Thomas of the Smith School of Business for further information. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Thomas, and I'm a professor of analytics at the Smith School of Business. My pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. So you might be wondering how the School of Business is involved with the Conflict Analytics Lab in the law school. So hopefully I can shed some light on that. Uh, the short version is uh, professors and students at Smith provide business and technical expertise, and professors and students at law school provide legal expertise. The so longer version is we first met Samuel a few years ago when he started at Queens and we were just chit-chatting in Goods Atrium, getting a Starbucks, talking about our different research paths. And we kind of had a uh, light bulb moment. What we realized was we were working on different problems, but using the same techniques. And so what I mean by that at Smith, we were applying optimization, analytics, AI, uh, to solve all kinds of really hard problems in the banking, finance, retail sectors. And in law, Samuel had big visions to kind of use the same techniques just to solve uh, different types of problems in the legal domain. So for example, when we were building tools to predict loan defaults, Samuel was thinking about analyzing customer complaints or where we were building tools to build customer facing chatbots, um, Samuel was thinking about Analyze, analyzing judge um, judge rulings, things like that. So the data, you know, the, the similarity is both both of us wanted to work on data driven analytics and AI tools. So that's when the light bulb moment came on, is because uh, you know we we have been building over the last decade lots of expertise in this area at Smith on applied analytics, applied AI to solve these tough problems and. This was a purpose, per, perfect opportunity for us to help the law school uh, kind of get started as well. So, you know, we started out with some simple questions, as, as you've been seeing, like, how can we analyze previous cases to make predictions about the future? How can we predict what a, a compensation should be? You know, what's fair about logos, um, logo similarity, all these kind of things. Um, and anyway, so, so Conflict Analytics was born out of a partnership and we, we still work very collaboratively now. And, you know, I only see it growing in the future as, um, you know, as more and more success, uh, you know, we're learning from our successes and our failures at Conflicts Analytics Lab. And, you know, we have other labs at Smith as well. We have a People Analytics Lab, a Scotiabank Analytics Lab for Customer Analytics. We have a, a partnership with the, um, the School of Medicine. So as we learn from all these applied analytics projects, they all kind of flourish together. Anyway, it's, it's been a great pleasure to for us to help real people with these legal challenges that they've had, and we're very excited for the future. And so with that, I'd like to pass it on to the next video uh, where you'll hear from our computer science uh, collaborators, Jaudan and Rohan. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiaodan Zhu. Uh, I'm assistant professor of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Queen's University. I'm also a affiliated member of the Conflict Analytics Lab. My research fields are in machine learning, uh, natural language processing, and artificial intelligence. I've been collaborating with Dr. Dahan and his students to develop AI models to process legal data. Our goal is to develop tools to assist and help legal practitioners. Uh, there are many challenges along with opportunities. We are particularly interested in developing AI tools that are not only achieve better performance, but also provide explanations on how the decisions are made, uh, which are crucial for many applications. Our PhD student, Rohan, will introduce some exciting tools we are developing. Uh, I hope you enjoy the homecoming. Thank you for the introduction, Xiaodan. Hi everyone, my name is Rohan Gamboria. I am a PhD student at Queen's University and I work with the Conflict Analytics Lab to focus on adapting machine learning and deep learning technologies towards legal applications. One of the projects I've been working on extensively involves utilizing state-of-the-art deep learning methods for the assessment of trademark cases. Towards this end, we hope to assist legal professionals by conducting research to create a tool for the analysis of trademarks. The aim is to shed some light on the opaque process of assessing the likelihood of confusion for trademarks. 
In doing so, we hope to reduce the backlog of cases for trademark offices by empowering laypersons with some basic knowledge of the process by means of an interactive tool. The trademark tool being researched on by Conflict Analytics Lab comprises of just a few steps to guide users towards the registration of their brand. First, we classify the goods and services provided by their company. In this example, we obtain NIS classes 30 and 32 with the highest probabilities from a machine learning model. Next, we provide the users with existing companies which had a very similar goods and service description as theirs. These will also be used to calculate a score for the final step of using this tool. Next, a user can upload a figurative and or a textual mark. We are then able to retrieve similar logos from a large database of images. And we can produce a saliency map of what a deep learning model focuses on for this retrieval process. We are also able to produce similarity scores of word marks by a string matching algorithm. Using the information from the previous steps, we are able to complete fields of a questionnaire. The user is also able to modify these values as the entire process is transparent, and if they feel that the results from the model at any stage were not reliable. Finally, we assess the risk of confusion on the basis of the questionnaire in the previous step of the tool. We also identify similar cases through usage of another algorithm and provide users with information that they may require for next steps, such as the registration crisis. Great, thank you so much, Rohan and Zhaodan for the video. I'd also like to thank everyone else that has presented prior to myself. Um, it is so wonderful to hear about everyone's unique experiences at the lab. I think it's very interesting that each student, each project leader, each project analyst, and also each professor involved gets involved with the lab in such a variety of ways. And I think, you know, our previous presentations have demonstrated the variety of ways that students do get involved with the lab, both at a leadership level and at a project analytics level. Um, we now have some time to take questions from our audience. And so if anyone in the audience would like to ask any questions to myself or to any of our panelists, we will be joining you, everyone on stage in a few moments. And you can please place those questions in the chat in the comment section and we'll be happy to answer it. Thank you. All right, I can start with a first question here, which is, is there potential for AI solutions in areas of the law not covered by CALS operations? Um, I'm happy to start answering this. And um, Stephen or George, if you have anything to add, please do. Um, the answer to the question is most definitely a yes. I think, you know, the consumer complaints projects goes to show that there isn't any area of the law that we cannot explore AI in. Whether or not it can be successful or whether or not the data is currently available is really up to the exploration of the lab as well as um, our industry partners. But, you know, I think it would suffice to say that it's worth exploring every area of the law that the AI could touch because, you know, as we've shown through our presentations, there's tremendous benefit in applying AI to areas of law that you might not think um, typically are AI applicable. And so, you know, how we typically handle new AI solutions is that we encourage viewers, we encourage potential partners to reach out to myself or Professor Dehan. I believe the information is currently showing on a banner on your screen, but you know, it's just, it's really as simple as sending an email to myself or Professor Dehan or both of us, and you know, posing the question that you know, this is the kind of data my law firm or my organization has. What can we do with it? You know, what legal AI um, solutions could be created? 
And, you know, the first consultation is almost guaranteed to happen. And it typically is something like Professor Dehan, myself, and relevant members of the lab um, in AI, in computer science, et cetera, joining in. And it really is an open and fruitful discussion about what AI could do, um, especially when it comes to Queen's Law alumni. We're always open to new projects and to new forms of collaboration. So, you know, I think the bottom line is please reach out if you're in doubt and we could find ways of making that happen. Thanks. Yeah, just to add on that a bit, um, yeah, I would agree there's a lot of untapped areas in law. And one of the biggest ones is in analyzing the actual text of a case or a ruling. So, you know, Jaudan, he said he's a natural language processing expert. That happens to be my expertise as well. Um, but the legal domain, when we first started, we realized is one of the biggest challenges, a typical legal ruling is really long. It could be anywhere from like three pages to 40 pages, or, you know, you know this. And in addition, in Canada, for any particular case, there, there may not be that many legal rulings, maybe, maybe a thousand over the last 20 years. And traditionally, natural language processing research that computer scientists do, they deal with the exact opposite. They deal with really small documents like tweets, you know, 140 characters or even an email, just really short. And then they have billions of examples. So we had we kind of hit a roadblock right off the right at the beginning with applying some of these natural language processing techniques. However, the good news is since then, even in the last six months, there's been a lot of advancements. In, and I don't want to bore you too much with the technical details, but on really large what's called large pre-trained language models that were trained on billions and billions of uh, like Wikipedia documents, like general purpose language, and then we can apply the knowledge that those models learned to legal and any document. Anyway, I don't want to go into all the details, but um, they basically open the door again for us to consider using these tools um, in the legal domain and not have to worry about the, the length of the document as much. So that alone is going to open up lots and lots of doors. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, yeah, so after after Stephen's answer, I just, you know, just to add something, because I think this segues really quickly into the next question, which is, you know, what are some in development or interesting potential projects for the future? I will go over this extremely briefly, but like Stephen said, there's so much in the works, you know, on the harassment side where we just submitted a proposal to the Department of National Defense and NATO for a military bias AI that's able to use our harassment tool as a foundation to predict military bias in the military complaints um, sphere. Some other examples include insurance, um, the ability to actually codify case law and use the case law and the odds of winning or losing a case to more accurately determine the rates needed for um, clients of insurance companies, for instance. Um, but that is just a start. And I noticed that we are running short on time. So I'd like to apologize for our viewers. Anyone that has any further questions, please, you can feel free to reach out to myself or Professor Dehan by email. But otherwise, um, thank you so much for your attendance. And it was absolutely wonderful to be able to talk to the audience about the work at Confit Analytics Lab. I hope you enjoy the rest of your homecoming weekend and we look forward to hosting you again in the future. Thank you so much.